Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for that introduction. I am so glad to be here to wrap up our time together today talking about building your rehab team. What we'll talk about will include a lot more than this, but I want you to know what speech, occupational, and physical therapy are. Uh, are those therapies or rehabs or rehab therapies necessary? When might you need it if you have Parkinson's? And then how do you get a referral? How do you make it happen? My background, a little bit more, I um, became interested in becoming a physical therapist because of uh, my being in band. And uh, so I've enjoyed uh, working with people with Parkinson's and um, the movement and, and music aspects too related to that. But anyways, I'm glad to be here. Here is our big picture. Therapies are a necessary component in the management of Parkinson's. That's our takeaway, necessary. Physical, occupational, and speech therapy. What are they? Big picture, physical therapy helps people to maximize movement, functional independence, well-being, quality of life, independence. And I'll stop there because now that's what PT, OT, and speech all do. The aim is for um, all disciplines to help you maximize your independence, quality of life. Physical therapy, big body systems. Um, we also help minimize secondary complications related to Parkinson's, like pain or injury or pneumonia, things related to balance and falls. We help, want to help you maintain physical activity and the health of multiple body systems. So we're looking at all of you. Occupational therapy is not uh, to get you ready for a job or to get you back to a job. Occupational therapy helps people improve the autonomy they have in everyday tasks. And these research studies that I'm citing are all specific to Parkinson's and um, these rehab uh, therapies that we're talking about. How does OT do that? By supporting your participation in daily life. It can be things like, how do you express your emotions? How do you maximize your resources, improve quality of life to carry out the roles that you carry out? Speech therapy helps people to communicate. Communication includes speech, voice, uh, the language, swallowing, and cognitive process. Speech therapy helps people to effectively communicate, which means speech therapists work with people who have social or cognitive or physical disorders, and they are specialists at working with Parkinson's as well. So let's get started. Proper multidisciplinary care programs can improve motor and non-motor symptoms and quality of life in Parkinson's. It's a huge statement. Multidisciplinary in this um, realm talks about Parkinson's and uh, use of PT, OT, and speech, um, and also, you know, involvement with your medication management with your physicians. So improving motor and non-motor symptoms, because exercise is often what we do, and exercise is shown to uh, prevent the progression of Parkinson's. What to expect in general when you go to a, an evaluation at any of these uh, types of therapies, when you sit down with a speech therapist or PT or OT, what happens? I have a background as a physical therapist, so um, my perspectives will come, you know, specifics might come from PT more than others. So the first thing we do is we take an extensive history. We need to know what medications you take, what are the side effects of those, what are all of the medical issues, strength, um, you know, roles you play, what are, what's everything about you, your life, your background, and um, what, how does that interact with Parkinson's? what is so specifically to Parkinson's, we might ask, you know, what's hard for you? Say brand new in the diagnosis, nothing's changed. Um, maybe family and friends have noticed something that's changed, either subtle ways in the ways you walk or the ways you use your hands to communicate or um, different ways that your speech might have changed or ways that you might manage the checkbook um, or not manage the checkbook anymore. But if any activities you participate in, which means the activities that you need to do the dishes, to get dressed, to take your kid to soccer practice, or to go to a grandkid's football game. Um, what are those uh, aspects of you that then we can help you with to get back to or prevent from being able to not do those things? 
So after we do a history, we then evaluate uh, how your movement is. We do that with tests and measures. Specifically for physical therapy, we're going to be testing you in the early um, aspects, early parts of uh, Parkinson's diagnosis. We are going to test you against a person without Parkinson's, the numbers at least, or say um, if we're doing a balance screening or a gait speed test, we are going to work with you as if your numbers need to be the same as a typically healthy person without Parkinson's um, and your same age range. We will do balance screenings, tests on strength, coordination, what your walking symmetry looks like, how powerful your muscles are. Occupational therapy, on the other hand, uh, works on handwriting, works on more fine motor coordination issues be that using your hands to button your shirt or to be able to wash the back of your head well, uh, to be able to snap your bra on, um, and also to be able to get down on the floor and play with your grandkids. The look at quality of life, multitasking, all to do with your activities of daily living. Speech therapy will do tests and measures that measure the loudness of your voice, the quality of your voice, the speed, uh, swallowing, also a huge um, part of speech therapy, articulation, the rhythm of how you speak, those are some of the areas that speech therapy can test. Uh, they have measures, evidence-based practice that we use to um, evaluate where you are and where we think you could be. And then what you and the therapist do together, you make goals. The goals need to be what you want to get out of it. Um, do you need to go to a grandkid's wedding and the church has steps that you need to get up. And right now it's been two years since you've really had to climb steps. So is that the end goal? And then what we do leads up to that. Or um, is it something else altogether? Is it you want to get better balance or just get stronger? Um, if you're coughing every time you swallow or after you drink, uh, something to do more with speech would be to be heard louder, to um, not uh, give up in a conversation. So lots of millions of goals because they're going to be specific to you. From there, the PT, OT, or speech therapist will make a plan and they'll say, this is how long I think it's going to take. This is how often I think you should come. And we will measure again in a month or however long to see if these tests have gotten better, if you've made any progress towards your goals. And every um, intervention or every time you come into your therapy session, how we get you to those goals is going to be different because we each have different skill sets, but we will be uh, generally that's how it works. Um, there's a reassessment portion. How are you doing? And then have you met all your goals and it's time for discharge? Come back in six months or are, um, come back in one month, you know, that kind of thing. Physical therapy specifically. We're going to read this. Um, Bottom treatments like exercise, gait training, stretching, functional activities, relaxation, dual tasking, tons of stuff, and especially balance. Um, we might need to help you stretch uh, to make sure your neck can turn all the way over to either buckle in a seatbelt or to look over your shoulder to be able to drive safely. Uh, whereas occupational therapy could also work on that same thing. We might use different ways to, um, to get there. I'd like you to read the um, middle one with me now. Therapy sessions should be coordinated with medication administration to yield the maximal effects from the drug. So what this means is when you go to any PT, OT, or speech, when you are in a therapy treatment, you need to be on. When your medications are the most on, meaning you've planned out when you go to that uh, appointment and those appointments are at a regular time, 11 o'clock, Tuesday, Thursday, 11 o'clock, Monday through Thursday, uh, but that 11 o'clock is the time where your medications are the most on. That's the way we can tap into the brain and get the maximal benefits uh, for accessing some of these neural pathways that need to be strengthened or changed or improved. Up top here, postural instability or balance, posture issues, balance changes. It's a cardinal feature of Parkinson's that improves with pharmacotherapy in milder disease stages, but becomes less responsive as the disease progresses. So we recommend that people are referred to physical therapy right after they're diagnosed 
or say diagnosis up to three years in those stages of being newly diagnosed with Parkinson's, your life may not have changed. You may not think you need physical therapy. You might have gone to a therapist and said they told you you didn't need it. But uh, one of the really important aspects of physical therapy is that medication will cover up symptoms, but some of the changes, the progression that happens with posture, balance, and um, strength and stability, those will still be occurring. Exercise changes the brain, prevents Parkinson's, we know that. So if we can get you involved in exercise early on, then we are you know, setting you up for lifelong success. Up here in this pink area, I want you to know what it looks like when you see a credentialed physical therapist. Uh, PTs, OTs, speech therapists are all um, we are licensed. Uh, we follow state and federal rules about how we can practice. We follow codes of conduct on how we can um, interact, and we all are held to really high standard. Physical therapists have their name, then they have their PT. PT is the only, these are the only two letters that designate someone in the state of Texas uh, that they are a physical therapist. True everywhere else, but I can speak to Texas. So if someone um, has put a PT behind their name, it means that they've passed their licensure exam, they are licensed, and they are um, okay to practice physical therapy. After you see a PT, then you'll see someone's highest level of education. The DPT is a doctorate of physical therapy. Yes, you can call physical therapists doctors. Uh, we have earned a clinical doctorate. We have done thousands, hour, thousands of hours of uh, clinical hands-on experience by the time we are prepared to go into the clinic and treat. DPT, similar to DDS, um, dentist school, podiatrist, uh, not medical doctorate, but a clinical doctorate. So DPT is what therapists will have now. Um, but some who graduated in the 70s would have their bachelor's in, part, in um, physical therapy. Uh, PT is what you need. And then the others are uh, add-ons of, of who they are and what they've learned. Anything after DPT, anything after that education aspect, um, specialty uh, letters, those now physical therapists are not supposed to put all those letters. They're supposed to spell it out what they are. So PT, DPT is standard. We also have physical therapist assistants, PTAs, also able to practice under the supervision and collaboration with a physical therapist. On to occupational therapy. Uh, research tells us that addressing ADL performance is important. What are ADLs right here? They are activities of daily living. Bathing, showering, toileting, Toilet hygiene, so not only being able to get up and down from the bath or the toilet, uh, but being able to wipe or clean yourself, uh, dressing, eating, functional mobility, like being able to reach to do the dishes as a part of um, household chores you take care of, sexual activity, personal hygiene, grooming, etc. Now, occupational does not mean you're working for a job. Uh, occupational therapy is important regardless of your retirement or working status. A lot of people just assume that's what it is. It is not. It is about what do you do for daily living, what are activities, and what's instrumental to that daily living, this longer list right here. Complex activities that support daily life in your home and your community. It's at the core of who you are, caring for others, managing your communication, driving, financial management, health management, medication, on and on. So those are also you know, realms that occupational therapists are trained in, as are other therapists. These would be some of our goals. But I want you to know that a study that came out in 2021, uh, these highlighted or bolded the driving, financial management, medication management, and shopping have been found to change for people very early on or in early stages of their Parkinson's diagnosis. So although we may not think we need anything, I um, want you to be aware that it's important that you are receiving evaluations by licensed therapists in all of these multidisciplinary realms so that you can make sure you are still independent and stay independent rather than subtly you have changes to your driving. Seven years later, you can't step on the brake pedal. 
uh, as fast as you could before and it feels like it's just a total surprise. Occupational therapists have different letters behind their name. They are um, masters based. They are come out of their schools. You have to have a master's to take the test to become an occupational therapist. But those um, schools are moving into a doctorate. So you might see MOT, which is Master of Occupational Therapy, just like DPT. OTD is um, a doctorate. So that's you'll see that more often. And their licensed uh, letters are OTRL. You don't always see the L, but OTRL means they are a occupational therapist, they are registered with the state, and they are licensed to practice. And then occupational therapy assistants uh, get an applied, uh, an associates of applied sciences degree or associates degree as do physical therapists. Most people who go in to become occupational or PT or speech therapy assistants, they um, typically have a bachelor's, but there's extra training uh, for two full years. And um, then they can sit for the assistant exam in their respective field. COTA or OTA means Certified Occupational Therapy Assistant or Occupational Therapy Assistant. So there are some of those. With speech, uh, it's different. So let's look at that. Look at this blue here with me. Um, speech therapists put their credentials at the end. So you will see an MA or an MS. Uh, they are studying communication sciences. Uh, some people like this middle dynamite. Hope you like the names I picked. <laughs> they um, some speech therapists might have extra training in uh, vocal training, so masters in music. It's not uncommon to find people who have um, extra training uh, in, in vocal arenas. Masters of arts would be in communication science disorders or speech language pathology. So SLP, CCC, SLP. We want to call them speech therapists but they are speech language pathologists. That is how they are licensed. Uh, that is what they are technically, but speech therapist, it is also um, you know, how you can refer to them officially. Uh, you cannot call yourself a speech therapist unless you have that CCC SLP. The CCC stands for, a, I'm looking, Certificate of Clinical Competency in Speech Language Pathology. That is the national board exam. So speech therapy right here below, speech language pathology improves their goal for speech is to improve the intelligibility of speech with behavioral treatment techniques like drills or exercises, instrumental aids, et cetera, that um, help improve quality of life and um, your ability to communicate. What you might think speech therapy is, is just going, ah, for a very long time and maybe that is it because that is how loudness is tested uh, there's decibel tests decibel meter tests some pretty cool stuff that they uh, have access to to help you see differences in the quality of your voice uh, the loudness of your voice see some of the motor changes that happen with speech therapy interventions so drills or exercises like that ah uh, or holding um, sounds are, that's one part of it if you're not sure that you've ever needed speech therapy if you've been hesitant, I'd like you to read some of this and you know, see how you answer. Under the activity level, do you use the telephone? Not still, but does it even, do you use it in a different way? Are you asked to repeat what you say? Does that happen, happen frequently? Do you find it difficult to formulate your thoughts? And then more in depth, do you ever feel excluded from conversations? Uh, does it feel like you have to pick either thinking or speaking because that can become a dual task when we have Parkinson's. So speech therapy is not just about being loud. Uh, it is about a lot of um, neurological change and is really vital to taking care of managing Parkinson's. Right here back to your uh, LSVT loud and LSVT big are two specific Parkinson's specific treatment techniques. They are programs. Therapists are certified in them. I have more information later uh, in this presentation, but great news. 
LSVT loud has been studied for decades. And right now we know it is the most efficacious intervention for speech and voice impairment in Parkinson's. That's great news. Uh, if you want to do speech therapy and you have Parkinson's, LSVT loud is the gold standard and what we recommend. Great news also, talking COVID times and how things have changed. Uh, telehealth is becoming more common. Speech is a little ahead of the game when it comes to telehealth and uh, with Parkinson's specifically, LSVT loud or one-on-one -on -one speech therapy was found uh, to be not inferior to telehealth. So uh, the, the, not vibrancy, sorry, that's what I wanna say, but you would have vibrant speech, but patients with Parkinson's have positive clinical outcomes. There is high patient satisfaction with telehealth to address Parkinson's issues related to voice and speech and communication. So it's very exciting that um, studies are out there saying uh, you get just as, as good quality outcomes if you do one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face as you do with telehealth. So when should you start therapy? Early and often. Uh, it is recommended globally that people are um, sent to physical therapy or other therapies for evaluation when they are diagnosed with Parkinson's. And that's recommended that you see it as a yearly checkup. Um, anytime you go see your movement disorder specialist, hopefully you also have an appointment to see your physical therapist. Maybe that's only a one-time visit, once every six months for many years, but it is a way that you can um, you know, prepare for changes that you might not be aware of. So early and often. With mild to moderate symptoms, we know that there are significant short and long-term physical benefits to PT, OT, and speech. Long-term, some uh, studies say six months, they've maintained how they improved in their therapy or two years even. And then also improvements are seen across different disease stages. Uh, you will improve generally with therapy anytime you start. And so even if you are sitting in a chair most of the day, uh, if you are, or if you're, you know, living your life with, as a CEO of a company, um, doesn't matter what uh, part of any kind of spectrum you're on in terms of your physical mobility, your speech capacities, uh, it is important that you build that rehab team so that you can know more about how your body is doing in relation to your Parkinson's diagnosis. When something changes or gets harder, um, that's also a time to check out, ask your doctor, or go seek out therapy. So how do you seek out therapy? We're talking more specifics here. Um, physical therapy has a form of direct access where you can go see a physical therapist without a referral. And often you can do 10 business days, but 10, sometimes 10 days or 10 sessions before you uh, need a referral from your physician to continue therapy. Typically, insurance companies require referral and pre-authorization to pay for therapy services, and some clinics themselves require a referral prior to evaluation. So there is direct access, but it's going to be very different clinic to clinic. Occupational and speech therapy, um, you can go get an evaluation done by an OT or an SLP uh, without a referral, but then to do treatments to carry out that plan of care, you do need a referral. So same thing, insurance companies can require referral or prior authorization. And speech, you can self-refer if you're going to pay out of pocket. Who can refer you? So you yourself, if you seek it out, uh, these are in our state act rules and regulations. There are certain uh, medical professionals that are recognized as being able to provide a referral for therapy services. So primary care physicians, neurologists, movement disorder specialists, also including nurse practitioners, dentists. Say if you have uh, TMJ or TMDD issues, uh, chiropractor, podiatrist, um, so lots of different folks within the medical field. And say you have not had a relationship with your physician where you felt comfortable asking them for a referral, or maybe they've never recommended it. Maybe you've gotten recommendations to just keep exercising. You walk, you're looking good, just keep doing that. 
I would disagree and and our um, guidelines now recognized globally is that you really need to be seen by a skilled professional for an evaluation and let that person tell you, yep, you're good to go, keep it up. Here's what else you need to add. So I hope you leave today encouraged and you, if you're ready to you shoot off that uh, message or you pick up the phone and you say, if you're not sure what to say, I want a referral for speech therapy to help address symptoms of Parkinson's. You can either insert your symptoms, my hoarseness, um, my quality of my voice, and that should be enough to get that conversation started. Or please send a referral for physical therapy, PT, eval, and treat for Parkinson's to such and such clinic. Their fax number is this. Give that clinician um, more information about where you want to go. It is your choice where you go and receive your therapy services. Insurance is different. Insurance can dictate who you see, who's in and out of network. There are also cash-based options. So there are a lot of options and a lot of types of clinics that PT, OT, and speech therapists work in. Insurance is different. Um, home health and outpatient is where I want to talk just for two seconds about these two um, settings. In home health, uh, you have to have a PT or some other kind of need along with OT or speech. You cannot only have occupational therapy needs to receive home health. Interesting, maybe never use that, but um, home health, you are required to meet some qualifications to uh, meet qualifications that you are technically homebound. Um, and that is, it involves a few things, but you can be evaluated for those things. Um, if you cannot drive, that is one thing that qualifies you or um, not cannot, but choose not to also. Physical occupational speech therapists work in home health settings. Nurses work there. Uh, nurses can come out to do medication management, education. Uh, nurses aides also are covered under home health services uh, if the doctor recommends it. So home health, comes from Medicare Part A or Part B, it is covered 100%. You do not pay, Medicare pays for home health. It's typical traditional Medicare. If you're on a managed plan, it can be different, can be more limiting. What you should know is that in home health, there are typically a lot of physical therapists, physical therapist assistants, fewer occupational therapists, even fewer speech therapists. So if you have a speech therapy need, we want to make sure that you have a home health company that can provide speech therapy at a frequency that is appropriate for your situation. When it comes to outpatient clinics, um, clinics at a hospital setting or at a mall setting, a strip mall setting right there, uh, these outpatient clinics can look so different. There are physical occupational speech therapy outpatient clinics Sometimes all three disciplines are there under one roof um, as a neuro rehab outpatient clinic. Uh, ortho and neuro kind of are these different realms we work in. So a lot of times there's their outpatient orthopedic and there's outpatient neurologic rehabilitation. So we're over there. Speech therapy sometimes is on its own. Uh, sometimes it's only PT and OT at an outpatient clinic. So these are things we need to figure out before we decide where to go. The environment you'll be learning in, working in, can differ dramatically depending on the size of the clinic, the number of therapists at the clinic, and the location. And speech therapy itself is often held in a more private space, um, like an office, but OT and PT would be typically held in a gym setting. Some PT clinics have 20 therapists and you're all in one big room. Some other PT clinics are uh, you and that therapist in your own space. So depending on how you feel like you'd benefit or where the therapist is you wanna work with, um, there are differences on, I think, how people react to the experience of getting physical, occupational, or speech therapy. And if you had a great experience in one place, super. If you had a not so great experience, let's try again. Here we go. Rehabilitation therapy utilization among older patients with Parkinson's in the United States is lower than reported for countries with comparable healthcare infrastructure. 
neurologist care is associated with rehabilitation, rehabilitation therapy use, but provider supply is not. So it doesn't matter if there are a lot of physical therapists, this, this one was about PT, um, if there are a lot of PTs or a few PTs in that area, uh, that didn't make a difference if people with Parkinson's were referred for physical therapy. If you saw a neurologist rather than the primary care physician or someone who is not a specialist neurologist, uh, being hooked up with a specialist neurologist meant your chances of being referred to multidisciplinary rehab, PTOT and speech were higher. And um, in general, in our country, it is underutilized, um, especially compared to other parts of the world. So we have some catching up to do, but I want you to know that um, if you have not been referred to therapy, it is uh, something we're experiencing on a national level. So this is where you become an advocate for yourself, both with your physician and at your therapy sessions. Physician-wise, go back, figure out how to ask them, or that's what I'm here for to help you with. But when it comes to your therapy, PT, OT, or speech, it is a collaborative process. If your therapy sessions, you're in the middle of them, and you're kind of mm, not so happy with how it's going, or you feel like what you're doing doesn't really translate to what you need to do at home, then you need to speak up. This is how you self-advocate. You tell and talk to your therapist about what you want to focus on and what's important to you. What's important to you is important to the therapist you're working with. Sometimes um, it's hard having those conversations, but it's really important that everyone's on the same page. Also, you want to be challenged at therapy. If you're there and the therapist spends 10 minutes with you, and then you spend the rest of the time sitting on the edge of a, a bed doing leg exercises, does that translate to, I can't get off the floor? What if I fall? So what we do in the clinic needs to mimic and mirror what our bigger goals are for Parkinson's. And also if an exercise hurts or if what you're doing doesn't make sense, let them know. Uh, plans are these malleable things. So do you see the therapist each time you go? How much time do you spend with that therapist? And how responsive is the front desk? Some of those questions are questions you could even ask when you're calling a clinic to interview the clinic. It is your choice where you go. Some clinics, you get one-on-one, -on -one, one hour time with the therapist. Others, you might get 15 minutes with the therapist, and then you spend the rest of the time doing exercises alone with an aide or a tech. And um, it's different for different people, but I would recommend that you are somewhere where you get that full one-on-one -on -one care because you need to, um, your brain needs that much help to reinforce new and proper movements. So building this team, how do you find the right therapist? Ask your friends and family, have they met someone they like? Call your insurance provider and see if they have um, a list of who's in network. Ask the therapist about their experience, call the clinic or contact me at HAPS or the HAPS office in general and we will be happy to get you connected. That's it for me. Thank you so much for uh, sticking with me and talking about this really important topic, my favorite topic, PTOT and speech, and you've got this. In the rest of your notes, I have more about, you know, the skilled, educated level of all of these disciplines about where they work or some about our continuing education, the national associations that we are affiliated with. And then finally, information about some of the Parkinson's specific uh, types of programs that you would be evaluated for in therapy. So thank you so much for um, sharing your time with me. And uh, I will of course be here for any questions and um, really appreciate everyone's time today. Okay, thank you so much, Maggie. There's so much good information there. I think what we've learned a lot is that in this continuum of care of Parkinson's is that it takes everyone being their own uh, greatest advocate. And um, you know, I think that we've learned that a lot of things now, palliative care, for example, is a term that we're now uh, much more familiar with and uh, is something that, uh, that we understand a lot of this other information has come into it. Certainly rehab uh, is part of that. So 
this actually does complete uh, the 2021 HAPS Engage, Educate and Empower Biennial Symposium. I know it's been a long day filled with wonderful information, question and resources. Uh, as we have said before, engagement is key. Knowledge is power and empowerment builds the confidence essential for long-term disease management. We hope that you're leaving today's event uh, even better informed and ready to put that knowledge to good use. As Maggie said, and as you all know, or as I hope you know, HAPS is here for you, to, ready to serve the Parkinson's community, just as we've been doing for the past 47 years. So I hope that you'll continue to check the HAPS website for uh, information on upcoming in-person events. That's right, we do have some in-person events coming up in October and then uh, later on in the year. Uh, there will there are of course additional virtual educational programs ahead of us, and we have our daily roster of classes that you can join online or in person. Good news is that we were able to um, record all of these sessions today. Uh, we've managed to figure out how those will be available to you shortly, so you'll receive an email with information on how and where you can access those videos to rewatch or in case you missed uh, portions of of a given presentation. Um, there is still a little bit of time remaining to visit and talk with vendors once we wrap up here. I think those uh, those uh, vendor booths will be open until three uh, central time, so you have a little bit of time left uh, to go and, and visit and chat. But again, I'd like to thank uh, my co-host for the day, which was Dr. Aaron Firstimming, all of our speakers. They did such a fabulous job, uh, lots of very thorough handouts, uh, our generous sponsors, and a big special thank you uh, to all of you who are joining us today. Um, and, I, and I do want to give a shout out for uh, to our sponsors, presenting partner, uh, Supernus, AbbVie, Accorda Therapeutics, Boston Scientific, UCB, AM Neal, Homestead Medtronic and Synovian. We've been, uh, they've been incredibly generous with us uh, throughout this year. Um, and so we are pleased to continue uh, partnering with them to bring you, you all these, um, these educational programs throughout the year. So uh, with that, uh, we hope that you all have a great rest of your Saturday and a great rest of your September. So thank you for joining us. See you soon.